Hello, beautiful tribe. Today, um, month of October, we are talking about depression. Uh, last time we discussed the subject with Farhad Fatani at Happy Everyday Coaching. And we discussed the problem through the lens of, well, coaching. Compassion, hello everyone, hello Laurence, Nanita, Berenice, I need Berenice to come on now. She is. Hello. Hi, I'm here. Good, good morning, morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, wherever you are when you join us. This is Berenice Miles. She is back. back. <laughs> For another tribe talk, yes. For another <laughs> tribe talk, because it turns out that you know, when it comes to natural healing, yoga and meditation are clearly an amazing, hello, Silvetch, um, is an amazing tool to heal pretty much everything, actually. And even though we are being told, uh, we have a hard time believing it. So you come back and you come back. First time we talked about depression, we talked, sorry, about um, anxiety. anxiety. We talked about eating disorders, and today we're talking about depression. So I was starting, before I started trying to connect you, I was saying that last time we talked to Farhad Fatani, who in Saudi Arabia joined us, to join the tribe, to discuss the subject uh, through the lens of coaching. And um, he gave us a lot of tips in terms of what is depression, and how to get out of it. And so this time, I thought we would talk to you and discuss it through the prism of yoga, yoga, yoga therapy, and meditation. So I should start by saying that, and maybe I say it last time, I'm sorry if I'm repeating some of the stats, which are quite interesting. 300 million worldwide um, suffer from depression before the corona pandemic. There was about one in 12 in the United States, at least that's the stat I was finding, uh, that was affected by depression today and after the two years of like in and out um, confinement, turns out that one in five people is affected by depression. That's 20% of the population. I don't know if you're like me, but I keep on hearing like the collective unconscious is extremely heavy, I find. There's a lot of people who are not sure actually anymore of what their life should be. There are big questions. And among them, uh, depression is the opportunity to answer those questions. So, Berenice, you suffered from depression. Do you want to start by telling us a bit of your story again under that angle? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, hi, everyone. I'm a Berenice, I'm a yoga and meditation teacher, a yoga therapist. And before all of that, I was working in the software industry and one of my colleagues is online now, so hi team. And what happened is that I didn't know at that time, but I was anxious, extremely anxious, constantly living in fight or flight. I was suffering from eating disorders and I was putting a lot of pressure on myself until the day I would collapse. And that's when the depression kicked in. So yeah, depression. I didn't go full blown depression, but I definitely had uh, depression episodes when I was younger and also after my brother's death. So yeah. Yeah. I myself, and I think I mentioned last time, I got caught up by, I got caught by depression about just the year before the corona started. I didn't know the experience. I didn't understand. I remember trying to talk to my friends who were depressed for the few that I had. And, you know, trying to intellectualize the principle, oh, but you should do this and oh, but you should do that. And you see, you'll be fine. And then I experienced it myself and I realized that all of this is just talk, like the, I found what is crazy is like the wheel, the drive disappears and um, you can't see clearly. And people say, oh, but you should concentrate on what you really like and what you read. 
you don't even know what you like anymore. You don't know what you like. You don't know where you should put your energy. And if it's worth putting your energy in, you know, like it's this kind of, shall we talk about straight up like um, the types of depression Absolutely. and then talking about the causes of depression. And then I think we can go, you and I discussed this before this talk today, obviously, because there's so much to say actually and where to start and we have just an hour. But, and we, we talked about the koshas, which is a concept in yoga. I was like, okay, maybe that's going to be too long. And I, I went through this again now. And I thought, we need to talk about this too. So maybe we'll okay. navigate through that. So let's start by the types of depression. Do you want to run us through it? Yes. So first of all, there's the major depressive disorder. So that's the most common. And it's characterized by at least two weeks of feeling depressed. Mm. Then you have dysthymia which is a constant depressive mood, which lasts for at least two years. So that's very long. Then you have what happens to lady, premenstrual, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Next is depressive disorder due to other medical conditions. So for example, if you have chronic pain or multiple sclerosis yes. or any other diagnosis that just goes and leads you to be feeling depressed. yes because pain is a stressor and we discussed that in our tribe talk on stress but pain is a major stressor when your yeah. body is constantly in pain or in imbalance like yeah. yeah and i feel also like for example in parkinson's my grandfather has parkinson and he also had major depression the feeling of seeing yourself being weakened and not being able to do anything about it, not knowing, that made him... Plunges you in depression. depression. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Then you have prenatal or postnatal depression. So once again, for us ladies. And the last one in the list is seasonal depression. So it might happen right now. It's autumn. It's going to be winter soon. And many people feel affected by that. Yeah. Um, the causes of depression what leads us into depression um good question many things many things <laughs> the word is a big trigger <laughs> for depression but um first it's being said that modernization is a big cause because we are more and more with our phones with our computers and we think that we are super connected when actually we're completely disconnected from others real people and ourselves and uh, this modernization leads to isolation loneliness and uh, being lonely is really something that that is like hard and uh, maintain the depression I, I think i'm gonna go straight into it because i feel that the marker, the stamp of depression is isolation. Mm -hmm. I should have started this talk saying like yoga, since we're looking at depression through the, the prism of yoga today, yoga in Sanskrit means to yoke, to unite. And depression is exactly, I mean, if there was one definition to give about depression, you'll tell me yours, but mine is disconnection. It's like disconnected from people, disconnected from oneself, probably not in this order, but probably disconnected from oneself first and then disconnected from your surrounding and your environment. I have this strong, after talking to so many people, healing people with depression, and uh, I have this feeling that this is really the, and reading books and, you know, knowledge is not you know going against this idea but yes. it feels like this connection is is the key disconnected from i want to say your soul like there is your identity and your ego and what you represent and the way you were raised and the things you were taught which are completely unconscious and the value you've like put onto things be it work or career or or other things not that work and career are bad things but having like set like objectives and and suddenly something happens in life and there's a discrepancy. There's like, oh, I'm not what I think I'm expected to be kind of thing. 
-hmm. if you're that disconnect this disconnection is key in the triggering of depression manifesting as an illness kind of thing yeah when you lost yourself definitely you've lost yourself and uh other causes social inequality and if you wanted to bounce back saying that it's inadequacy so why do you think it's inadequacy tell us i think i was talking about this as inadequacy it's like the, ined the inadequacy of um I don't know. I feel like we have been taught so much at school everywhere what values are, what we should be. And it feels like every now and then in your life, you could be, would like to be something else. And it's breaking through with everything you knew behind this, in this inadequacy, mm -hmm. the inadequacy of like, I'm not where I should be. I'm not doing what I, I, I should, or I should enjoy doing what I'm, not enjoying right now or i should be happy with what i got right this sense of inadequacy whatever that is mm, you know? it sounds like pressure you know it sounds you like pre pressure, it pressure 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 until it stops you collapse and then it's depression after the pressure. depression that's mm. it yeah other causes <laughs> quickly malnutrition so um, sedentary lifestyle Ma so, malnutrition and sedentary lifestyle sorry i'm just too much maybe uh, that's very much a, an ayurvedic perspective on depression what you eat does matter if you eat kapha food and depression belongs to kapha in ayurveda it's not really true there are types of depression in ayurveda i mentioned that in my previous talk with fahad but yet there is still something common to the three types of depression it's the couch potato kind of thing. And actually, you were, we were discussing that. You found like there is a survey that shows that people depressed are actually much less physically active than people. So that's very kapha. It's kind of, I'm on my sofa, you know, binge eating, eating kapha food, heavy sugars, stuff that are not difficult to digest. This kind of thing is going to, increase the chemistry or increase your propension to be so going away from this kapha food and people who don't know what kapha food is you can google it or will but it's like the heavy the properties of kapha are heavy and sticky and immobile and static mm -hmm. and there is this sense in ayurveda within depression yeah and isn't it funny because in ayurveda it's often the food you crave that you should stay away from. So yeah. depressive people, they are likely to eat heavy food to comfort themselves, and yet it's not the best food. So yeah. Yeah. Next is sunlight deficiency. So that's why many Nordic people, Nordic countries, I mean, are suffering from high rates of depression. And suicide, and, yeah. And suicide, unfortunately. And the last one, the two last ones are genes. So if you have people in your family who've been suffering from depression, you're likely to have depressive genes, but it doesn't mean you're going to be depressed for sure and that it's a fatality. Yeah. You can always overcome that. <laughs> this is my big thing over the last few talks that we have on the tribe here. There is this question, and next month is going to be about cancer, and that question popped again. The concept of guilt versus responsibility. I think there's something extremely empowering in knowing that we are the actor in our, uh, in our own depression. Someone suffering from depression and hearing me saying that now could say, oh, but then I'm guilty, I'm responsible, I'm guilty of my own state. And I wanna clarify this, it's all the opposite. I mean, if you feel like depression is something that falls from the sky and you are a victim of it because your grandfather was, was depressive or your mother was depressive and it feels like there's something in elect like something that's, you know, you can't avoid. I'm going to have depression. It's happening to me now. That's the way it is. And I'm going to have to live with it the rest of my life kind of thing. Or... I've eaten too much kapha food. I am not in agreement with myself right now. I am being pushed in doing things that don't make me happy. 
and I'm depressed. And actually, I can reverse this. This is, I think, for me, it is like so, so, so important. And the reason why I will talk about this story later, but there is an example that's close to me where this poor lady was told that she was depressive and she was bipolar and she's going to take X, Y, and Z medicine the rest of her life that makes her constipated, tired, numb, you name it. And okay, maybe temporarily, but how does medicine today, allopathy today, allows itself to tell us, oh, well, you know, your father was depressed and you are depressed now and you will be, and you need to be on medication pretty much forever, which is what, you know, there's something terrible about this, isn't there? Or is it just me, like... No, it's definitely the limitations of Western medicine. I'm not saying it's bad, you know, like uh, sometimes it's essential. However, they just treat the symptoms. They don't take the person holistically. They don't consider the person and they don't treat the root cause. So that's why giving medicine and pills to someone depressed is not going to solve the problem. The person's just going to hold on to life, survive with pills that make them feel numb and emotionless and all of that for the rest of their lives. And that's when yoga and Ayurveda can be really helpful because it's about taking everything into account, you know, your breath, your food, your lifestyle, your moving, how you're feeling within, without, etc. So, yeah. Yeah. So, but obviously it's do this, do that, da, da, da. And, but the lack of will is so intense, right? The lack of being able to catch yourself together and emerge from that is so intense. But I found myself with this person trying to convince her that her situation was not forever. I mean, we know the impermanence of things or we have to kind of get a grip with that. Even shit as an end, first of all, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's very important. I'm going to take this example, actually. This is a lady who is functioning in society, coming from a good background, quote unquote, not a difficult one or a traumatic one necessarily. And it feels like, and she has the first depression when she stopped university, supposed to get into some corporate job, gets to the door of the office in a very urban environment that's very oppressive. And actually she tells me, I just opened the door and I couldn't, I had to leave this place. This is not for me. So everything that she'd done, the studies, the, the, the internship, the work, the this, was leading her to some place she actually never really wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. First depression, young, 20 something. Six years later, second depression, right? Because the thing is with depression as well is that it's chronic. And like yeah. when you, you have it, you've had it once, you are more prone to develop it again, unless you do something about it. And this is what we're gonna talk about a bit later. So then second depression, uh, meds like antidepressors, she has like, she starts to have like suicidal like thoughts. And this is where allopathy does it well. And because like these medicine that they give you like this are numbing you and probably are going to help you not take, you know, action upon, you know, this kind of negative thoughts. Okay, great for that. But then she's an under antidepressors forever. It gets better after months and months and months. She's not so happy. She's still going back to work. Ah, boom, she's pregnant. Now she's pregnant, third depression, postnatal. Within six months of having a baby, she feels inadequate. She feels like she has to manage 10 hours of daily job plus being a good mom. She feels distant from the baby. She tells me that she feels like he's probably going to become autistic just because she's not there to provide. She feels the guilt now, right? And don't know how to get out of it. What does she do? She wants to throw herself from the balcony. Instead, um, she decides to check in into a psychiatric hospital. She gets there. She says, nobody asks her. Her husband tells me, we got there. Nobody asked me how she leave, what's wrong, what's going on. She's not like going through a therapy. 
she's bomba bombarded with like um, antidepressant. Now suddenly she's diagnosed with being bipolar, manic depressive. So yes, you are depressive. You're not really manic, but still we, it's a type of bipolarity. And then now she has this stigma on the forehead. I am bipolar mm -hmm. and she needs to take X medicine which, as I said, makes her constipated. She can't eat anymore. She can't, that don't, doesn't know what to eat anymore. She did that, 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 that. Okay, so she didn't commit suicide, fine. But she is stamped, she is marked, and she believes that she will not get out of it. And again, I'm repeating, but I am doing these tribe talks because I just want to pass on that message to people that there are things to do. Yeah. Right? There are things to do. And you are not your diagnosis. You know, like that. This is it. You are not depression. I was not eating disorders. As soon as you can separate yourself from this identity, say, I feel depression right now instead of I am depressive, that's going to make a big difference. And that's when yoga comes into play because yoga really helps you to reconnect to yourself. And It just happens, you know, you unroll the mat, you do the physical practice, the breathing and stuff without doing anything else, just follow. And after several months, you're going to start to have this connection with yourself and feel different. And that's it. That's the journey, as they call it. So you are not your diagnosis and there are solutions. That's, I think it's like the first step to healing is to understand that. I really yeah. do believe that. Yeah. yeah. Should we um, talk about depression in the brain? How I'm looking works? at my five pages notes. <laughs> Where do we go now? Um, okay, diff different depression, fair enough. Okay. Uh, we were talking about the causes of... So we were talking about the genes. And I think like, sorry, I digressed massively because I wanted to just say, okay, it's not because your daddy... But you were mentioning something that you found out that in your family there was depression and that actually helped you to find yeah. out that you were not the only one in there. Yes, because in my family, I am the only one having so many issues. So the list of anxiety, depression, eating disorders, uh, PTSD. And <laughs> I'm the only one who's very sensitive, apparently, to just talk about it and seek help for that. Uh, and thank you for that. <laughs> You're a wreck. <laughs> yeah, I am a wreck. I'm just shaking the family up. <laughs> yeah. But they love me for that. No, uh, more seriously, my, I suspect my mother to be inherently depressed. However, she copes very well and she uses hyperactivity and other sorts of addictions, such as compulsive shopping and relationships and food and exercise, blah, 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 to just numb it, which I've done in the past with eating disorders. Like eating disorder was just the plaster over depression. So my mom, uh, both my grandfathers are actually, um, yeah, chronical de chronically depressed. And one of them had to stay in mental health hospital, which I just learned a couple of days ago. And one of my grandmother is severely depressed. And my great grandfather, which was a big revelation to me, was also like in a mental health hospital after war. So, you know, it was not very fun and he died there. And I didn't know any of that before. So mm -hmm. even though I'm the only crazy one, it sounds like there's still a bit of a pathway, you know, through the generations. And somehow it made me feel like relieved, you know, because, wow, I, I'm not the only one. I'm not saying it's because of them. I still take responsibility of myself and of what I can do, how I can heal. But it just made me relieved, you know, and yeah. 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 So the thing about being the crazy one is also something I heard myself say to this person who was depressed. I heard myself say, to her, you know, honestly, the crazy ones are probably us who keep on living in the world as is. Yeah. I mean, everything is like kind of, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but yes, there are a lot of, you know, health and our judiciary system. I mean, this pandemic has shown a lot of things of, you know, the shortcomings of the system. 
and this like I mean there's a lot of things to be like nature the environment the f we, we it's difficult to be healthy sane and happy I, I'm it just is. saying it's almost like a very normal reaction to be depressed <laughs> when and, you see what's surrounding us right now right and to truly be happy, not to fake it, you know, not to seek some happiness in materialism or relationship or to be able to just live simply and wake up with a smile on your face. Because I think when I was depressed at my lowest, I also had suicidal thoughts. And I remember one day I just called my mother. I was just crying. I told her, I, I don't know how to do life. How do you do that? It's so hard. Well, she, she just blew up on me. She screamed at me. But uh that's hard, you know, because you don't know how to do life and what you only want, you just want to wake up, to feel serene, to feel happy for your life and that's it. And that's hard for many, many people and that's okay to feel this way too. This is it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is the biology of depression? What's going on biologically in ourselves? So... What happens in, in the, the brain, brain yes. yeah, what happens is the brain is that there's a, an insufficiency of uh, norepinephrine, which helps for action and uh, to mobilize the brain. There's also a lack of serotonin, which is happiness, well-being, and dopamine, which is the hormone for pleasure and reward. There's also something interesting. There's a low level of BDNF, which acts like a fertilizer for neuroplasticity in the yeah. brain. So the BDNF helps for neuroplasticity, which explains why it's so hard for depressive people to change because they have less chemicals to build this neuroplasticity. So uh, can I just interrupt about the neuroplasticity because this is the neuroplasticity is truly the key to how meditation can change the game. And we're gonna yep. get there and we're gonna talk about it. But I just want to say that uh, thinking that the brain is like this like locked thing, the, way, the same way we thought that DNA is also something that does not evolve according and depending on your experiences. We know now that it's wrong scientifically. And what I mean scientifically with our modern science and the allopathy. allopathy. And so we do know that this is exactly that that's going to be able to heal you. At yeah. the same time, in a depressed person, there is less neuroplasticity, so there is more resistance to feeling the bliss or to getting there. Yet, this is something you can change again. Yeah, and it's something to practice daily with a willingness, with courage to show up. And I know that having a routine when you feel depressed is a huge challenge it's <laughs> impossible for me it's like climbing a mountain but uh just one baby step at a time and to just explain more like what happens in the brain when you meditate so here you have like the primal brain and here you have the prefrontal cortex and the primal brain is like windows 98 right the old old computer system. <laughs> yeah. so the one that is so sluggish and low and slow that you don't want to use anymore and when you start to meditate, it's like having upgrade, you know, update of the system. So you're triggering your prefrontal cortex. And now it's, I don't know about Windows, but probably Windows 20 something now. I have Apple. So meditation is like upgrading your brain and helping you. But for it to really work, to be sustainable, it's daily practice, even if it's just five minutes. Mm. Yeah, we're going to talk about all this. So... Um... Uh, there was something that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, we said no. We said the people with, with depression are usually less active, which shows us like another way of contributing to healing, which would be so forcing oneself to have a physical, even if it's like a walk in the park. And nature is going to come in as well as a remedy, as a matter of fact. The neuroplasticity, we just uh, talked about it like a second ago. Um, so shall we talk about the stuff to do? Yes, definitely. So um, yoga. yoga. Yeah. Yoga. And why yoga? Um, quickly, there was a, a study 
over 10 weeks. It was a meditation and yoga yeah. plus psychoeducation program. And after nine months, the group that had yoga, meditation, and psychoeducation had 77% of remission. So it's huge. It's huge. Compared to only 36% of people who only had psychoeducation. So, so psychoeducation, we're talking about going to see a shrink or a therapist? Yeah, most likely. And probably having some, you know, like knowledge about how depression works, what can help you, maybe some lifestyle, but no meditation, no yoga whatsoever. Okay. And so you go from 36% to 77% the minute you add yoga meditation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And how can yoga help? That's the question. Well, I'm excited about it because I love yoga. But uh, <laughs> first of all, yoga reduces isolation because even though you don't want to talk to anyone, especially when you're feeling at your lowest, going to yoga class, stepping on the mat and having other people in the room doing their own thing like you creates a sense of community. In yoga, we call it belonging to a sangha. And then that's what you said, Eve. Uh, people need to to meet at least once a week. Yeah, connection is key. Yeah, it's um, yeah. One has to try to find ways to reconnect yeah. and reduce this isolation and loneliness. Though, as a result, yeah. Um, there's a yogic principle that we've mentioned before here that's called ahimsa. Ahimsa, yeah. Um, Non-harming non-violence towards the self and others and when you go to a yoga class with a good teacher often you're going to feel this loving kindness feeling emanating from the teacher and on the long term you're going to start to feel this for yourself as well i remember when i started yoga after three months i was just like wow i'm being nicer to people and people <laughs> were also noticing it <laughs> and most importantly i was being more kind and compassionate towards myself. And that's a huge step for healing because I feel in this world of pressure, you should be this way and being, you know, like ostracized because you have depression. It's like you're a bad person, you're weak, you're a loser. You should do more, come on, just get up and, you know, be motivated, be positive and listen to self-development and all of this. Like that doesn't work. <laughs> no. I believe the first step is really to, be acceptant and to be compassionate for yourself because the first step is for people who listen to us to trust us <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> trust us and so point number one have a yoga class weekly right with a good teacher. online online physically whatever just connect show up or even right? a YouTube video, you know, it's free. And if you don't want to come to But to, to have this sense friends, of non-isolation, maybe something live is better, right? Yeah. Just, I mean, when I do it on a recording on YouTube, I just do it like this, you know. <laughs> okay. When it's live, I do it properly. Yeah. I think that pushes you and it helps you like to yeah. commit to something, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because there is a, a live event. So that's point number one. Point number two and to go back to what we were saying, the neuroplasticity of the brain, if you don't trust us, trust science then. Half an hour of yoga every day for two weeks will get you out. Yeah. Half an hour, it's very difficult to meditate half an hour. The brain is going to tell you, uh, get out of there, move. Just what are you doing here? What the hell are you doing? That doesn't work. This is crap. This is BS. Blah, 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 blah. Yet, if you decide to remove that voice, right, and stick to it and commit to, I'm going to sit half an hour every day, not five minutes, half an hour every day, that's, two weeks. I think that's a bit too much for someone. I know. I know. You're the started. soft one. I'm the tough one. <laughs> All right. Good cop, whoever. Cop. <laughs> what I'm saying is like, Half an hour every day is what, in two weeks, is what's needed to get out of it. I know it's going to be difficult first, but it's difficult the first time, it's difficult the second, it's difficult the third, and then it stops being difficult because your brain gives up. 
The brain stops telling you, mm. stand up, go and do this, get out. The, very quickly, the brain stops this resistance. And then suddenly sitting half an hour becomes easier. But I'm just saying like if someone has a, at least the intention, sit down every day, make room for half an hour, in two weeks, see the changes. Yeah. Or you can go for the softer method, which is <laughs> move for 25 minutes. So it can be yoga or dancing or going for a walk, a brisk walking in a park or anything. And then sit for two minutes, you start. And then by the end of the two weeks, 10 minutes. And if things come up, uh, there can be your brain bombarding you with thoughts and that's okay. But there can also be trauma coming up, memories from the past and stuff that are hard then I would just say seek help from a professional trauma specialist, uh, inner child healing or this kind of therapies. Yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah. So over time, what's going on with these practices is that your brain, again, the neuroplasticity of the brain allows for changes um, at chemical level. So the serotonin is going to kick in again the neuropinephrine is going to balance itself out. I mean, all the dopamine and all these hormones, suddenly the hormonal system. Um, I think it's a good time. I mean, we're talking about, I'm talking about the biochemistry of the brain. There are a few things that one can do uh, which are supportive of those changes, chemical changes. So for example, essential oils, um, we talk about Melissa. What's the name of it's lemon citron citronella? Melissa, citronella, yeah, yeah. So it's called Melissa, bergamot, and lemon are very good essential oils. So you can burn them like every day. You would to change again. I'm talking about the, the chemical changes. You can you should increase the amount of fresh veg that you consume and reduce like obviously the processed foods and alcohol. Uh, ashwagandha is a very good Ayurvedic herb. Ashwagandha, be careful though, if there is a lot of anger in your depression, ashwagandha could increase that because ashwagandha balances vata, but increases slightly pitta. So if there is a lot of anger in your depression, ashwagandha probably isn't um the solution but in that case you can go to Sh shatavari asparagus racismus which is like it's a vegetal ostrogens and it's a very it's a favorite of ayurveda as well it's a very good herb to compensate so when i say you just take half a teaspoon if it comes in powder half a teaspoon a day for about two or three months no side effect nothing bad about it um the spices which are quite useful, saffron, cinnamon, uh, the wakame seaweed, I never tried that, but apparently a teaspoon of wakame seaweed is quite good. Ginkgo, you know ginkgo biloba, yeah. is very good for angry depression. We have depressions which are marked by anxiety, that would be vata, uh, pita is very angry, and kapha, is more like, as I explained earlier, a bit more like couch potato kind of thing, more like sentimentally depressed, you know, a heartbreak, or like a heartache, like Kafa can feel very like someone has been disloyal to them, a letdown, an abandonment. That's, that's the Kafa type depression. Uh, there's a tea as well, which I'm drinking no less, than, no later than now, mixed of uh, passion flower and St. John wort. So mixing these two herbs is actually a very good, uh, again, have a glass or two a day of this uh, herbal tea. What else is there? Turmeric. Turmeric is excellent for depression. Uh, in Ayurveda, we teach, we are taught that turmeric, you know, putting it in a juice or is not very well absorbed by the body. So I always advise rightly or wrongly, I'm not sure, but this is how I, as I was taught. Turmeric is much better absorbed by the body uh, when it's cooked in fat. So it's better to add turmeric to your cooking. 
And then Ayurveda also has something very efficient that's more like time consuming and an, invol an involvement kind of thing. It's Panchakarma. Mm -hmm. So Panchakarma is an Ayurvedic treatment that solves a lot of problems. Uh, when it comes to getting rid of toxins and depression is seen as, like in Ayurveda, like both the toxin of the body and the toxins of the mind. So yeah. eat the kapha food too much, too long, forever, you know, reduce your physical activity. You've been made redundant or you're in furlough and you stay at home on your couch and you eat this kind of heavy food and you don't have anything, you know, depression. And that's a vicious cycle then, so. Yeah, yeah. Do you like, even I get your butt out of the couch, go to India and do a panchakarma. That's how we met, so. That's true. <laughs> Good things come of it. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so then uh, the mind-body approach. Mm. Yes, um, yoga and Ayurveda are both mind-body approaches and they help to get out of your head where the depression happens, the ruminative thoughts, the, the loop thing. overwhelming mind and yeah, going on and on and on to go back to your body. And uh, we know that depression often happens in the past. So in yoga, we believe that when you're serene, it's because you're in the present moment, connected to your breath, to your body. When you are anxious, it's because your mind is in the future, always anticipating and thinking ahead. And when you feel depressed, it's because you live in the past. So being regretful, sad, nostalgic, etc. And let's remind, um, let's remind everyone as well, uh, this rumination, this endless talks, uh, talks to yourself the hindus say you are not this body you are not this mm -hmm. mind you are not the mind and that ties back to what you were saying at the beginning that was so important you i am not depressed yeah. i experience feelings of depression i am not those feelings yeah associating if you start looking at these negative thoughts which are in a loop and ten thousand of them and all, as something that doesn't belong to you they are just thoughts they are to be put where they belong this is a time in your life this is not who you are this is not what you are and they are not more valid than thoughts of happiness actually they are not more valid than thoughts of there are no less no more they're just thoughts yeah that i think that helps not attaching to those thoughts you know not latching yeah. onto them as if they were a truth definitely when um, my brother passed away two years ago, there was a meditation that saved me and that I did every day for a couple of months from Sadhguru. And it was just inhaling, repeating to yourself, I am not the body and exhaling, repeating, I am not even the mind. And just that for 20 minutes because I was just going crazy. Uh, I just, yeah. <laughs> and if I started to attach myself to the thoughts of my brother being dead and what was happening in my family and the cows, then just all of that shit, sorry for the word, I was just going crazy. And this moment of just, I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am not the body, I am not the mind, I'm much more than that. There's a soul inside of me that is here and safe and strong and stable. That's, that was just life-saving, so yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, uh, the most effective yoga. Mm, Let's yes. talk about that for depression. What is it? There if I'm depressed and I want to start yoga, what would be a good thing for me to do? Well, it's a, case, sugar? it's a case by case approach. So I would ask you, do you feel depressed, but with a tendency to anxiety and anger or depressed with a tendency to lethargy and, you know, not moving, not doing anything? So who are you, Eve? <laughs> I'm angry, I'm anxi I have anxiety. Okay. And so I'm... you're more rajasic, depressed. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm using uh, weird words, no need to learn that. But uh, for rajasic or anxious depression, first is to do like a more slightly active yoga to just flush out the energy, the anxiety, the stress, the cortisol out. The vinyasa, body. for example. The vinyasa, some salutations. Ashtanga, and then... vinyasa, yoga. 
yeah, at least you start with me. something that's at your level where you start. You start with something that's high energy. Yeah. Right? And then you slowly, gradually slow down and then go for some breathing and guided relaxation because in the start, in the very start, I wouldn't let you in full silence for 10 minutes because I know that the thoughts, the mind are just ruminating and overwhelming. Mm. So, yeah, some breathing there, like yoga nidra, dirga breath, this kind of, yeah, this kind of practices. So let's talk about this. Okay, so there is the, the asana practice, which is yeah. the physical practice, which is going to help a lot with, uh, you know, like... Well, it's basically moving the energy in the body because when you feel depressed, you are not moving, you feel lethargy, and often it's going to be linked with people having joint soreness, you know, like chronic like pain in the body. And we want the prana, the energy to move. So even if it's just gentle stretches and, you know, to get you to move a bit, to get that prana to flow, because by instantly moving, you're going to start to feel slightly better. And it's going to send chemicals to your brain and you're going to release a bit more serotonin and dopamine. So, yeah. yeah. However, it's not the most important. The most important are breathing and meditation to help for depression. That's so it. That's, yeah. So breathing and depression, like yoga, the physical asanas are more like uh, help to get to the state where you can actually meditate and you can actually yeah. breathe properly. And so you loosen the body to get to this place where it becomes much easier mm. to actually stay still and in silence and you get there with time. Yeah. And so breathing, so that's it. So breathing, prana, energy, moving things around. Yeah. Pranayama, breathing exercises. Um, I always want to say to people to be extremely careful with pranayama and that they should find like a pranayama that's balancing because yeah. a lot of time, you know, people are using this like uh, fire breath and which is mm. actually the opposite. It's just raised, uh, you know, everything and that's not what we want. So we want like a kapalabhati kind of breath, very balanced, not, not kapalabhati, sorry. The, 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 shodana the, or the shodana, exactly. Yeah. The shodana yeah. uh, would be a good one. So that's that's that. Um, sound healing is actually, I should say that because I'm also a sound healer. Sound healing is extremely good to get to this um, to this stage again. You started by saying that this parasympathetic nervous you system. Know, system, nervous system that needs to kick in. Like sound healing is extremely good for that. Physical massage is good for that. And as we said, like physical asanas are leading you and helping uh, de-stress the body and relax the body so that you can actually sit in stillness <laughs> and breathe again properly. And the use of chanting also. Chanting in yoga is very helpful. Uh, and also mudra as its hand gestures. Yeah, That's chanting it. is... Uh, we, have other, we have done a tribe talk on... Uh, ragas with Arita from Mumbai which was amazing and she explains a bit why chanting is so soothing and why music is because some most people don't realize that there is a science behind it you know and making a guttural sound and, and using your palate is going to have an effect and, and doing a you know those vibrations balance you from inside and yeah. people don't really believe in this even but it's though simple because it's uh, you're triggering your vagus nerve which is your longest nerve and the vagus nerve starts at the back of your head of your neck and it goes down to your genitals and this huge nerve going through all of that here is linked to your parasympathetic nervous system which is calm restore digest rest so whenever you sing you talk you do gargling like oh you're triggering this one part of your vagus nerve and then nervous system that is calming and another one is that physiologically speaking even though we are highly visual beings the reality is that we have more nerves ending 
um, going from our sense of hearing to each of our organ through that um, vagus nerves, right? And so we are extremely connected to sound and sound and harmony is what we call also a passive meditation. Mm -hmm. For those who have a hard time going into a meditation by themselves and sitting for this half an hour, you know, without being fidgety and getting out of it, like uh, sound and frequencies can be extremely helpful to overcome at least the first barrier between stress and moving into a place where the practice of meditating every day is becoming like something much easier mm. to perform. And one last thing with you guys that it's a tool for you. Like uh, whenever I help someone in yoga therapy, I just equip them with tools that they can use by themselves. So it's reclaiming your self-efficacy, which is huge because when you feel depressed, you feel weak, powerless, and like a victim, you know, and you often have people telling you what to do and so on. Whereas when you start to have a little routine, do some yoga, maybe chanting, you know, going for a walk and stuff, you're like reclaiming your power. And that's very, very helpful for recovery. So in all of these, I think, uh, again, if we assume that the depressed person is someone who has lost the will, the intention, very often dreams, desires, mm -hmm. the drive is kind of gone. And we are telling them to join a yoga class and meditate by themselves after an hour every day. And that seems very challenging. So I want to say here that ask for help. Find, yeah. find your tribe. Those yeah. are the tribe talks. Find your tribe. Find a sangha, a Buddhist sangha. Find a group, a meditative group. Join and just decide to show up, even if it's like once a week. Just going to a, when I say a sangha, it's a Buddhist term, but that can be a kirtan. That can be something where you show up, start like every month and then every week, and then you make friends and then you reconnect. And then you start your yoga practice asana because you've met someone who told you that there is this great teacher. And if all of this is extremely foreign to you and feels like you're going to have to put together a whole plan and structure that you don't have the strength to go through. Mm -hmm. Just start with maybe a yoga and start with like sitting down five minutes every day. I think it's very core and crucial. And you said it before actually earlier, but it's crucial to insist on the fact that the everyday is the key, isn't it? Yeah. Journaling helps a lot. Uh, we didn't mention it before, but I remember, and I still do it, you know, every day I just wake up and when my mind is overwhelming, I just write down free write for 10 minutes, all my thoughts on paper. And it doesn't have to make sense. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. And then just as a way to let go of what's happening up there. And then just observing and just being aware like, oh, these are just thoughts on paper, but it's not reality, you know? And really to have one little practice every day to for which you show up and that's it and yeah knowing that you're doing your best being kind to yourself because it's not easy it's a journey for the brave and the courageous and uh yeah every healing journey every single healing journey is a journey for the brave yeah. every healing but, i really uh, believe that now <laughs> just healing like um, the real origin of the word to heal comes from German, I think. And it means to become whole. So it's really to become your whole self again. So as you said, depression is being disconnected. So maybe there's a part of yourself. There's probably a part of yourself that is not connecting anymore with you. And depression is the opportunity as hard as it might feel to reconnect with yourself, to become whole again and to be your purpose in life yeah my because uh, it's already one o'clock so my conclusion after having this chat with you after having the chat with um farad two weeks ago and for whoever has missed it it's another approach to depression that's also very interesting with i think keys to whoever suffers from the problem have a look at this video as well as you know that um, 
what comes out of both of them, and really for me, it's every healing journey, is the opportunity. And for whoever is watching and is depressed right now, he probably wants to slap me because he doesn't see any kind of opportunity, but more like a nightmare. But healing and illness is an opportunity to change something. I think it does help, you know, if you are depressed and you think this is an indicator, my body, my all, everything is telling me I am, something needs to change, right? And spending time on what is this thing that I need to change to be more in agreement with myself, to be more, when we call, we say connected, yoke, yoga, all of this, fine. But how do I go? I do feel that like depression is this disconnection from the self first and then from the others. And so find and look at it as an opportunity to reconnect, to go towards your, your true soul, not the mind, not the body. It's yeah, and there's, there's something that always helped me is that the darker it is, the lighter it can be. So it's the opposition, you know, and in yoga and other spiritual belief systems, it's all about that. There's feminine, there's masculine, there's divinity, there's evil, quote unquote, and there's yeah. dark and light and everything is changing. It's not forever. Uh, the Chopra says about that, he says, if you suffer from depression, take the wildest self-affirming action possible and fully commit to being there yeah. on the planet and in your body. Wishing to leave is distracting and essentially delays healing. I mean, yeah. escaping of one... That was my big thing when I experienced depression two or three years ago. There was a point, I, I just, I, I felt like someone had to come and to operate and to take this brain of mine out of my head. I could not shut him up, you know, I could not. And something strange happened just right after, which was that the lesson was stop trying to shut him down. Be with it. Yeah. Stay in it. You need this time. This is an illness. The illness says you need this time. You need this nothingness. You need that. And it's weirdly, it just it doesn't sound like it's helping, right? Because you stay in your crap pretty much. But actually, crap is where I needed to be, kind of thing. Or and actually crap went away. The minute I felt like this. Yeah, that's, um, I'm also like following a spiritual group in India and that's what they teach, you know, if you feel the pain or whatever is coming up, just like there's a tiger, just jump in the mouth of the tiger, just go for it. And then that's it, you know, like let yourself be immersed in the depression, the pain of the trauma, the loss of loved one or a divorce or whatever, and experience it with your body and like feel the sensations. And it's, you're going to think you're going to die out of it, but actually not. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important not to doubt the journey. It's very important to know. I mean, there are, there is a science. If for those who need numbers, there is a science. It shows meditating. And I said it half an hour every day for two weeks can change the game entirely. I know half an hour is not easy. Being in silence is not easy, and, but that's the idea. And I, I think like that's another conversation, but what is meditation, you know? Mm. For me, with years, meditation has become silence. You know, I just don't want to be guided anymore. I find it very difficult at times to sit in silence and to not be fidgety and to tame the brain, to stop telling me, okay, just stop this crap, stand up, go to the fridge, just get a coffee. Like, get on with your life, get on to your computer, you need to do this. And that's the most difficult thing. But when you think that this is a voice and this voice is outside, then it becomes slightly more, e I mean, easier. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And it depends on what you focus on, you know. Do you want to let the voice to the brain, the monkey mind, the ego voice, 
or do you want to let the voice to your heart, your soul, your inner self, whatever you want to call it? Yeah. Ooh. Ah, deep breath. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was, again, very interesting. Do you want to say something else? Yeah. Um, we can finish with the breath of joy. Um, I know that it's a bit hard for people to stand up and do a breath of freaking joy when you feel, feel very, very low, but uh, let's, let's go for it, Eve. <laughs> so you just stand up. And it's going to last just one minute, you know. So basically, make sure you have nothing around. And you start by inhaling, raising your arms up, inhaling a bit more arms on the side, inhaling arms up again, and exhale, slide, bend the knees and forward fold. And then doing it several times. So inhale, 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 forward fold, bend the knees. One more time. And exhale. Let With the mouth. Go. Yes. Nice. <laughs> and that's very quick. You can do it in the morning. It's like not even one minute and just fake it until you make it. And uh, yeah. Inhale up. Inhale on the side. Side. Inhale up again. Inhale up. Exhale and, all the way down. Yeah. Forward. And bend the knees a bit, you know, like don't be like uh, rigid knees. We don't want you to hurt your lower back. Namaste, sister. Namaste. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank, you, thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, my sweet. Uh, is there any comment or questions or does anybody want to say something or share an experience or anything? Anyone? Look at this. Hello, 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 hello. So many people. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk. On these good words, a big kiss to you. Thank you, Berenice. Thank you. Um, we might do this talk in French at some point, but we'll tell other people. Next month is a cancer month. We're going to talk about uh, breast cancer specifically. I have two guests, one in English, one in French, actually. Two ladies who are survivors. And we're going to talk about same thing, how it comes, why, and um, how to navigate as much as possible with as much compassion and help and the rest. So in two weeks, on the 3rd of November, Berenice, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, I hope to see you very, very soon. And I can't thank you enough always for all your knowledge, your kindness, your uh, being the good cop while I'm being the bad one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And much love to everyone. Much love to Bye, all everyone. of you. <laughs> thank you.